Jane taught us how to observe, understand, and value the earth and life around us. Now we have a responsibility to put our own observations to fruitful use. And here we are in this glorious 1887 landmark, talking about Jane Jacobs, who famously said, old ideas can be used to new buildings, but new ideas must be used to old buildings. Tonight, we are especially honored to have Mike Michael is a man of vast talents and an extraordinary breadth of experience. He is currently the architecture critic of the New York Times, formerly the art critic there, has written coaching essays from all corners of the globe, won many awards, and if that were all not enough, he is also a professional pianist. Jane would have loved that combination. Michael is a true New Yorker, born in Greenwich Village, and an extraordinary observer of urban life, writing not just about architecture, but about the urbanism that defines a city. Following Michael's lecture, I will join him on the stage, and we will take questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, really, in this beautiful place. and. Uh, and underneath uh, Kiki's window, and uh, we all owe Roberta a great debt for uh, giving us this place. It's a pleasure uh, and an honor to cap off this, this series celebrating Jane Jacobs' centennial. Um, Jacobs addressed the great disruptor of the 20th century that was the automobile. She taught us many lessons about protecting ourselves and our cities uh, from global upheavals which she associated with what she called dark ages. Lessons about protecting our values, our streets, environment, and social fabric. So I want to talk this evening about what bids to be the next great disruptor for the 21st century. I, I don't mean our reckless, uh, clueless narcissist in the White House. I mean the driverless car. I think Jacobs can help us prepare. But first, um, I myself did not know Jane Jacobs more than passingly. Growing up in the village, not, not very far from here as a matter of fact, uh, I knew her as the woman who, like others in my neighborhood, uh, including my mother and aunt, um, fought against Moses and the bulldozers that helped save Washington Square Park, where I played with friends, um, one of whom is here. <laughs> um, and uh, also save what came to be known as Soho, which uh, in effect started across the street from where I lived. She was one of several strong women, uh, including Ada Louise Huxtable, uh, whom I looked up to as soon as I started to read the Times as a teenager and to develop an interest in architecture and urban affairs and who shaped and uh, shared, obviously, my uh, sense of the city as a home, uh, an ethical endeavor, a crucible, and a calling. The other day I came across an article I wrote um, about driving around with Jacobs uh, in Toronto, where she showed me, among other things, the Dundas Sherborne Community House, whose preservation, which she helped ensure, became kind of the Boston Tea Party of that city's urban revolution. And sometime later she asked me to contribute to a fest shift in her honor, and I focused on my little uh, tribute on the ease and clarity of prose in death and life. It's direct, down-to-earth language, which expressed the street-level, everyday truths about the city that refuted the abstract, top-down pronouncements of planning authorities and academics in her time. This granularity of language transcended urbanism, and it still speaks, I think, to the general humanizing clarity of mind that is essential to criticism of all forms and an antidote to sweeping pie-in-the-sky theories. We may love those theories helplessly because they promise to explain everything and relieve us of the complexity of unpacking reality, which is, and I actually think this is the joy and challenge of life, always gray, never black and white. Although, let's be honest, Jacobs was tempted by these theories too, and after dissecting how people function at the level of the curb and sidewalk, 
She analyzed how cities function within nations, how nations function with each other, and how everyone functions in a world of conflicting moral principles. The problem she ta tackled became almost ridiculously sweeping. By the 1970s and 80s, when national politicians and prognosticators were pretty much giving up on cities, she was presciently pointing toward them as incubators of innovation and economic growth. With the turn of the millennium, when globalization promised a flat world and endless opportunity for everyone, she wrote Dark Age Ahead, her last book, published when she was 88. It warned of resurgent populism, xenophobia, nationalism, and mass amnesia, and it was widely panned at the time. I looked through it again recently. Jacobs leans heavily on the popular geographer Jared Diamond, who among other things explained that ancient Mesopotamia lost its cultural edge, quote, through environmental ignorance, in essence, via the desertification of the Fertile Crescent, by cutting down forests for wood fuel faster than the forests could regenerate, by denuding valleys which silted up, and by irrigating so intensely that soil could no longer be tilled because too much sand had accumulated. A second efflorescence of Middle Eastern culture during the Spanish Middle Ages, based on the scientific and literary flowering of Islam, was then quashed by a rejection of outside influences. The xenophobia, she said, is another telltale trait of a dark age. For Jacobs, the warning signs are clear. Environmental destruction, rejection of science and technology, the institution of what she calls a, quote, fortress mentality. Today, the phrase, I think, is America first. She also identifies the impact of large-scale societal change dividing winners from losers. In Dark Age, she was still talking about the ill effects of automobiles. With globalization, today's big disruptor, we see winners and losers split along economic, generational, and party lines, spreading political havoc. I couldn't help but think of Trump's pandering to coal workers and attempts to dismantle the EPA when, in Dark Age, Jacobs warned how, quote, any institution, including a government agency that is bent upon ecological destruction or an outrage on the built environment, argues its case or bullies its opponents by righteously citing the jobs that supposedly will materialize, or even more effectively, the jobs that may be forfeited or jeopardized if the ugly deed is not done. To this day, no alternative disaster, including possible global warming, is deemed as dire a threat as job loss. Now, Jacobs focused on five what she called pillars of our culture, in which she saw, as she put it, ominous signs of their decay. Community and family, higher education, the effective practice of science and science-based technology, taxes, and what she called, quote, self-policing by the learned professions. She acknowledged that readers might be surprised she didn't cite racism, environmental calamity, crime, voter distrust of politicians, the growing gulf between rich and poor, and the attrition of the middle class. She called these, quote, symptoms of breakdown in the five I have chosen, adding, hindsight may well expose my blind spots. So truth be told, her categories do now seem uh, kind of tendentious and ill-formed, but within them, she finds familiar ground. So a chapter about the, quote, dumbing down of taxes is really about the failure to ensure government spending goes where it should leading to an impoverishment of infrastructure, a crisis in affordable housing, sprawl via highway funding rather than public transit support, and a widening economic gulf. Her chapter on the family ends up as another disquisition on the car. Quote, not TV or illegal drugs, but the automobile has been the chief destroyer of American communities, she concludes. And she refutes neoconservatives 
quaint term today, um, who claim the collective triumph of the car and suburbia is merely a democratic voice of the free market expressing itself by recounting tales of how General Motors, Firestone, Standard Oil, and Phillips Petroleum conspired with politicians to thwart streetcars, public transit, and in general, the greater urban good. For Jacobs, the city continued to be the irreplaceable bulwark against civilization's decline, its guarantor of creativity and diversity, which seems truer than ever, especially when cities are under attack by so many reactionary forces supported by the White House. Let's remember, meanwhile, that the largest federal subsidy today is still the mortgage interest deduction, which adds up to $100 billion annually. In effect, a subsidy for automobiles and suburbia. Gas taxes don't begin to reflect the actual costs incurred by cars, from pollution to depressed land values near highways, while public schools, city parks, and social housing received next to nothing by comparison. The federal government has been out of the business of building public housing since the Reagan era, a move that, like so many others pushed by conservatives, has had racism at its root. Housing, after all, was a mission when it provided white workers and veterans with a leg up after the Depression and the war. Then it was abandoned when integration in public housing coincided with white flight. Americans are still moving to suburbs even while cities are growing, but patterns of settlement are far from based on the free market system today. A level playing field where suburbs and cars actually paid their fair share would, I have no doubt, drastically alter those settlement patterns and go a long way toward creating a more equitable, environmentally sustainable, and economically vibrant nation. Already, 90% of our gross domestic product and 86% of our jobs are generated in 3% of the continental United States, meaning in our cities. Blue state residents pay disproportionately to support red state ones. Meanwhile, cities are hardly blameless. They continue to squander billions of tax dollars and their streets to subsidize curbside parking, for example a small instance of the unequal scales of American justice. There's obviously next to no sign that the current president grasps any of this, but who knows? He changes his mind every hour, <laughs> insisting Syria isn't our problem and suddenly attacking Syrian airfield in retaliation for a Syrian chemical attack on its own citizens, then seeming to forget all about Syria the very next day when the Syrians flew another mission from that same airbase. We're admitting, this is one of my favorites, that he learned all about North Korea only after a 10 minute briefing by China's President Xi over the, as you recall, the most beautiful piece of chocolate cake at Mar-a-Lago. And as a consequence, I haven't entirely given up hope that he yet, may yet learn the virtues of infrastructure projects like the gateway tunnels under the Hudson River over some gorgeous slice of pizza with Chris Christie or a piece of Junior's cheesecake with Steve Roth. In any case, Jacobs was clearly in some respects a prognosticator, uh, not just an analyst of streets and neighborhoods. And her prognostications grew from historic obsessions. Born 101 years ago tomorrow, I think, she rightly identified the heavy hand of 20th century planners seeing the consequences of their failure to understand cities and of their, quote, faith in monoculture, as she put it, expressed by garden city dreams, Levittown developments, and anti-urban projects, including the bygone world trade towers, which she lamented with its false panacea of centralized commerce, its vast, empty windslip plaza and tower platform. I suspect I know what she would think of the office park that has replaced it. Of course, through the influence of her writing, Jacobs has helped shift planners thinking dramatically since the 1960s. This is no longer 1964 or 1994 or even 2004 when Dark Age came out. And an educated public 
having absorbed Jacobs' ideas and moved on, has also come to grasp a little more fully the complexity of the urban experience. And by this I mean the challenges of incremental, community-based, ground-up processes that Jacobs rightly challenged, but which sometimes thwart big ideas. And also to see the benefits of sweeping power that Robert Moses grasped and then increasingly abused. We have come to see, as Jacobs didn't really, that a metropolis like, say, Los Angeles, the antithesis of her notion of, the, of a city, has fostered economic growth, diversity, culture, and an urban fabric teeming with life. Today's world, in other words, requires a broader view of cities than the one encapsulated by the village, circa 1962. We need Jacobs, but we also occasionally could use the young Moses, who gave us so many parks and beaches and playgrounds. Jacobs saw the negative impact of this last great revolution, the arrival of the automobile and all that it brought. She saw this after the highways had already arrived, the suburbs begun to sprawl, cities decline, smog choked the air, after the redlining and white flight and racist targeting of neighborhoods in the name of urban renewal, obliterating underserved neighborhoods and making the village in which Jacob settled and I grew up a seeming paradise of human scale, block by block, diversity and resilience in a society being overrun by freeways, office parks and malls. By the time she published Death and Life, that tsunami had already happened. Today is different. We may actually want to welcome big Moses scale thinking to help us manage the next wave of change before it strikes. We have an opportunity Jacobs didn't. And we can't be put off by the uncertainty of this challenge or by the urgency and scale of the actions it requires. In effect, we need the young Moses to ensure Jacobs' legacy survives. I am talking about the potential next great disruptor, the driverless car, or autonomous vehicle, as it is also called, being developed by nearly every major automobile manufacturer and half the tech world, which promises, for better or worse, to do what the automobile itself did a century ago, remake nearly all facets of our daily lives, our cities, economies, and environment, to reshape the planet. But how? And I should say, I'm as cognizant as Jacobs was of the chicken little humiliations of futurology and of exposing my blind spots. But in the spirit of dark age, and to close this series of lectures in her honor, I want to follow her footsteps and point us toward a new mission. So far, the, most of the talk about autonomous vehicles has focused on their technology and the business angle, on the race to build them, and how, say, they will be programmed so as to decide whether to crash into a mother uh, with a baby carriage or a pair of nuns, um, given that everyday dilemma. But safety and technology are the only beginning of the story. The implications for jobs, health and elder care, industry, privacy, productivity, the insurance business, climate change, and so on are vast and they are especially profound in the realm of cities and land use. Now there are two scenarios. Auto autonomous vehicles will either usher in a panacea of uncongested, newly remade, fresh air cities where curbside parking evaporates, people share cars rather than own their own because that's so much easier and less expensive, and vast amounts of public land are suddenly freed up to create green spaces, affordable housing, neighborhood businesses, bike lanes. That's one scenario. The other scenario is that they will bring about Carmageddon. The number of vehicles on the road will not fall, but skyrocket, with car owners not just replacing the cars they now have with driverless vehicles, because they want their golf clubs in their own trunk of their own driverless car. But for those who can afford it, 
acquiring additional cars for their children and elderly relatives, and who knows, even for their pets. Because now vast swaths of the population that couldn't or shouldn't drive will be able to get around in cars that drive themselves. In this scenario, as people use more driverless transportation, public transit income, income could decline, creating a vicious cycle whereby the demand for cars goes up because the supply and quality of buses and trains plummets. In that case, what is today's biggest economic, I'm sorry, today America's biggest economic crisis, the growing divide between rich and poor, have and have nots, will only become much worse, seeding social unrest. A recent study called Driverless Future, a policy roadmap for city leaders, prepared by Arcadis, HRNA Advisors, and Sam Schwartz Consulting. For the few of you who have not yet read it, I will help you. Um, <laughs> estimated that driverless ride sharing will take over up to 60% of cars on the streets in the New York metro area during the next 15 or 20 years. That's 3.6 million cars. In Los Angeles, the shift will be 44%. In Dallas, Fort Worth, 31%. McKinsey estimates that AVs, autonomous vehicles, will represent 15% of global auto sales by 2030, with trucking and ride sourcing companies like Uber as early adopters. Now think about this. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there are more than 4 million professional drivers in the United States alone. Their jobs will soon become obsolete, replaced by more technical and customer-oriented jobs that require a higher level of training and qualifications. Now, there are 174,000 blue-collar, coal-related jobs in America, which helped Trump win the White House. We're talking 23 times as many workers. Meanwhile, there are as many as 2 billion parking spaces in this country, occupying up to 16,000 square miles of land, the equivalent of Connecticut and Vermont combined. The quantity of parking spaces amounts to roughly eight parking spaces for every car. Parking and driveways at a typical suburban mall take up to 80% of the land. Streets and parking take up 45% of downtown Washington, two-thirds of downtown Houston, 14% of the incorporated land of Los Angeles County. That's not to mention gas stations, repair shops and car washes. There are 150,000 gas stations in this country, 175,000 auto repair shops across the U.S. Now think about the cost of providing that parking. A study in Oakland, California, found that government-mandated parking requirements pushed up housing construction costs per apartment by 18%. An underground parking garage at a shopping mall in Los Angeles can double construction costs. What happens if you remove those costs and free up those spaces? Because people are no longer buying cars. They're using shared driverless vehicles. What are the effects on house prices and commercial real estate values? And what happens if robotic vehicles make streets safer? Would more people turn to cycling because cars won't hit them? What in turn would be the health effects? Stronger hearts, as well as fewer accidents, and the effect on health care. Because of their convenience, and depending on their pricing, we all, may also see the reverse. People taking an autonomous vehicle a few blocks, rather than walk. Passengers can watch a movie, text, or take a nap in a car that drives itself. What are the ripple effects on the airline industry? If as Vanity Fair recently asked, rather than fly from Los Angeles to San Francisco, you might get into your car at bedtime and program a destination so that you could wake up in the peninsula. The carbon footprint would change, too. There are some, currently some 33,000 people in the United States who die each year in car crashes. 94% of those accidents are caused by human error. Driverless cars promise to erase those numbers. But even if zero is only a dream, what will be the impact of dramatically improved safety on doctors, ambulance drivers, people who work in body shops, glass repair shops, 
auto auctioneers, telemarketers from AAA, loan underwriters, credit managers, actuaries, rental car agents, and driving school instructors. The list goes on and on, and here I quote Vanity Fair again, traffic carts will, be completely, will completely vanish. You can't speed if you're not driving. Americans rack up $6.2 billion in speeding tickets, gone. Billions of dollars in parking tickets, gone. That is a lot of income that no longer goes towards repairing streets or schools, public services like public transit. A truck with no one behind the wheel doesn't need to stop to get a burger in the middle of the night or use the restroom. All of this makes the people who work at rest stops and motor away hotels useless. As I said, there are these 150,000 gas stations in the country. It turns out that half of all tobacco products are sold at gas stations. They're largely impulse buys. If they and the highway truck stops largely go the way of watering holes for horses in the Wild West, what might be the consequences for smoking, health, and health care costs? Now, some cities are already beginning to think about these things. Columbus, Ohio has come up with a proposal to deploy three electric self-driving shuttles to link a bus depot to a retail district, offering access for the city's poorer residents to areas where there are more jobs. Another idea is to use driverless cars to provide more health care access to the city's poorest neighborhoods where infant mortality is four times higher than in the rest of the city. And 22% of baby boomers are already or will soon be at risk of becoming elder orphans with limited access to transportation. Obviously, a wide deployment of driverless cars could potentially allow older people to live more independently for a longer period of time. But does this mean these cars will also enable and even accelerate sprawl, allowing suburbanites to live further and further away from cities, knowing that they can play on their devices or order lawn furniture from Amazon while doing door-to-door -door commuting? Will it encourage white-collar companies to move out of cities because their workers can enjoy the driverless equivalent of limousine service to remote office parks that now seem inconvenient? Might it encourage another wave of white flight if we disinvest in cities and public transit? Finally, remember the cameras. Pretty much every iteration of the autonomous vehicle envisions HD 360 degree cameras capturing everything that goes on around them. A driverless car is a moving panopticon. Think of what that implies for policing when CCTVs and mobile phones seem quaint and every single car will supply streaming data that can be fed into facial recognition scans. You'll recall the civil liberties issues that arose when security cameras started to become ubiquitous. What will privacy mean when every car is a camera? For Jacobs, the savior of humanity, the defense against the dark age, was the city. And so let's just think for a second about the urban fabric. Now, cars, I believe the lanes out here take up about 10 feet, about 10 feet wide. And the reason they're about 10 feet wide is because humans drive cars and we don't drive straight. A driverless car is like a train. It's about six feet wide, and that's about how much room it needs. So suddenly, even if you have the same number of cars in transit, you can reduce the width of the lanes greatly, but you can also potentially reduce or eliminate much of the curbside parking. Now, I asked Jeanette Satikon how much of New York City is taken up by the streets, and she said about 24%. So, if you begin to imagine that you're liberating large swaths of streets, narrowing lanes and turning over ones that are now used for curbside parking to uh, bike lanes, um, rapid bus transit, streetcars, or just parkland and wider pedestrian fare, you are potentially changing completely the shape of our streets in a way that cars began to do progressively over the last century from the time when cars shared our streets with pedestrians, bicycles, uh, streetcars, and horses, and then gradually 
took over. What could we use that extra space for? Well, not just the things I was saying, but potentially to create something like the Ramblas in Barcelona, where you might have, say, retail in the middle of a wide street, or even more room for housing. I think the, the possibilities are enormous if we begin to plan for them and think about them. I mean, in the end, this is coming. If you live in Silicon Valley, those driverless cars are not the future. They are out there on the street right now. And I've had friends who've gone riding in them as recently as two days ago. Um, and I think we need to be able to begin to think and imagine how these streets need to change. I was just, you can see I'm just remembering, I was walking down 80th Street the other day, and I just wanted to comment on this too because I don't know how many of you now take these sort of things for granted, but I do. I was walking down 80th Street between Columbus and, between Amsterdam and, and Columbus because I was going, uh, taking our younger son to the Museum of Natural History, and it was a Sunday, um, and it was, as you may recall, a beautiful day. 80th Street um, is, of course, a lovely street, but the sidewalk is extremely narrow, and there are planted trees on that street as well. And the sidewalk is much, is very poorly maintained and largely cracked. So you had large numbers of people on, out on a beautiful day, many of them with strollers, creating gridlock on an entirely, on a, a, a hard, an area that was hardly wider than this podium. And I looked around me and I thought, while we were standing there waiting to try to figure out how to negotiate these, this, this sidewalk, next to me were four lanes for cars, two lanes for parked cars, and a street wide enough for two cars, which had virtually no one in it. They had a few parked cars for the privilege that we pay um, to allow these people to keep their cars over the weekend, and almost no cars going down the street, and hundreds of people crowded onto the sidewalk. We take this for granted now, but this is not what streets used to look like. This was not the configuration of New York a century ago. We can reconfigure these streets, but only if we get ahead of this problem. I return to that study by Sam Schwartz and the rest of them on the driverless future. I just want to read you what it says. Cities that do nothing face major risks. If proper policies are not in place, transit agencies may lose revenues, cities may be left with large areas of empty parking spaces, and residents and businesses may move in large numbers to suburban and rural areas. On the other hand, cities that prepare for this technology can reap, sorry, I lost my place, so, uh, can reap many benefits, such as the removal of millions of cars from the road, a more sustainable environment, increased mobility, efficiency, and social equity, new employment opportunities for drivers and redevelopment of existing parking spaces. Public policy will play a decisive role in shaping AV technology and guiding its impact on cities as it did during past technological revolutions involving the railroad, the streetcar, and the automobile. Cities have a window of opportunity to shape how the autonomous vehicle is used and must act now to define policies that minimize risks and maximize the benefits of driverless technology. I agree. So we have had only an inkling so far of a public discussion about governance, regulation, planning, community input, equity, and environmental impact. This will involve big moves and political courage. Major corporations pretty much have the driverless road to themselves now, testing cars and seducing us with promises of a bright, shiny, hands-free future. It's not unlike the rosy vision of the open road that car and oil industries promoted a century ago. And if that experience is any guide, the future may bring exactly what Jacob feared, another dark age. In this case, where the Ubers, Ubers and Googles of the 21st century, as did the GMs and Standard Oils of the 21st century, as did the GMs and Standard Oils of the 20th, profit at the expense of the underserved, our streets, and our unity as a nation. Jacobs ended Dark Age Ahead with a little advice about avoiding a new one. A culture, she said,
can avoid that hazard only by tenaciously retaining the underlying values responsible for the culture's nature and success. That is a framework into which adaptations must be assimilated. She remains, I think, our plain sense guide in an unfolding new world. As she put it, climbing out of a spiral of decline or an abyss of mass amnesia is so difficult and chancy and entails so many ordeals and hardships that a much better strategy is to avoid falling into terminal messes. Let's consider ourselves forewarned. Thank you. is that people will not want or need to own their own cars. They'll, it won't be convenient, and they can also um, be made too expensive to own. And this is where regulation um, and pricing for both public transit and a lot of other things comes in. Um, and you can imagine that uh, the way the scenario works is, look, cars are nine-tenths of the time at rest. So the principle is that you can have the same number of vehicles moving about, but eliminate all the parked vehicles, and um, people will be able to get around just as easily. Now, whether that is true, whether what happens to the car when I'm not in it? it uh, somebody else is in it. It's moving around. Now, you seem to revert like somebody who your reaction to that wants your golf clubs in your own trunk. <laughs> so the question is, do we make it too difficult or expensive for you to do that? You know, one of the scenarios that I, I think of is um, the easy pass lane. And I, I have to tell everybody here that um, I've never owned a car. Um, like well, in the New Yorker, so I love driving, but I've never owned a car. So I, I say this as a biased person. But, um, but in the easy pass lane. So if we all recall, um, when that was first instituted, not many people were using it, and we were all sort of driving in the lane where you had to pay money, and what was this thing, and what, what. And after a little while, not very long, people thought, you know, the people in that lane are going faster than I am. I wonder how that works. And now, and that's not so long ago, you can't even really find a lane to pay cash. It's almost impossible. Easy. That, that is the principle, that there's a period of transition when it is just clearly easier and better and made so for the driverless vehicle um, over you owning your car. You can do that in different ways. This is, again, why regulation and planning matter. Um, you know, these transitions can take place quickly. Uh, how many years ago was it when we banned smoking? And in Paris, too, and people thought that's crazy. And, you know, people adjust very quickly if they see the benefits of it. So um, the question will be, you know, how many people will just find it more convenient and better uh, to not own a car? Um, but, the, but the driver's vehicle will not work. It is a disaster unless, um, unless public transit remains in many ways a, 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 a better alternative, better either economically and or for simply getting around. And this is, the, this is why I mentioned more than once this question of pricing and its effect on, on, um, on public transit. You, you know, I, I realized that this seemed like it was going in another direction, but think about what Jacobs was confronting, the, the revolution, essentially, of the city that about, 
of, of the city and its relationship uh, to space. Um, and that was caused, of course, grew out of the dominance of the automobile and what the automobile opened up, um, socially and economically as well as spatially. So, I mean, I think this is potentially going to create many of the same uh, opportunities and challenges, um, and we can get ahead of it, uh, or we will be done in by it. I really believe that. Um, that makes sense. I also think uh, that we can only get ahead of it if we continue, as Jeanette's icon uh, has begun, to take back some of the streets for pedestrian yeah. and elimination of parking. Um, but I also have to say, in a kind of Chakotian, um, cynical way, that I would imagine that the GM U.S. Steel Firestone guys will co opt this. Well, and but not go to public transit and will not go to the assessments that you're saying are required to make Well, what work. happened then, look, what, what happened this, this a century ago was that. Um, those industries worked with government to tip the scales of, to tip the balance. Uh, and as I said, there's no you know, entirely free market system operating here. Um, and I think that happened because uh, they sold a bill of goods about what, the, what was um, being offered. And because there were huge benefits to the automobile. Um, so, of course, uh, you know, uh, the interests of Google and Siemens and Apple and, and Ford and, and Daimler and so forth are their own. Um, if we do not uh, begin to uh, petition our government officials and as communities and cities uh, to begin to think ahead of the um, threat but also the possibilities, then of course they will do it again. Um, I mean, that, that is what they do. That's their job. Well, also, we hear every day the debate of infrastructure spending. Uh, of course, public transit should be right in front of that. I just recently had the misfortune of driving from New Orleans to Southern Florida and up to New York. And I have to tell you, I kept wondering, where is the lack of money for highways? Yeah. There was not, there was rarely uh, a stretch where there is is some expansion, mostly expansion, because I drove on a lot of highways needing yeah. repair. Uh, but there is plenty of money going out there, and that seems to be the predominant favor. Yeah. Uh, and and I really need an awful lot to turn that ship around. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I mean, um, you know, I was just in London and. Uh, and I'm going to be writing something about um, the, the project called Crossrail. Effectively, Crossrail is a, um, a new, rapid, <coughs> large-scale uh, subway line that goes from Heathrow all the way to southeast London to Woolwich and, um, and Abbey Wood, um, and uh, will cut commute times um, from those th those neighborhoods of southeastern London and, and eastern London. Are uh, some of them in East London, or East London have changed, obviously, dramatically and become like parts of Brooklyn. But areas like uh, Abbey Wood and Thames Mead uh, and Woolwich are still largely very poor. And that's because they've never had adequate transit, and cars are the only way for people to get there, largely immigrant communities, but even before that, white, poor, white uh, areas. Now they will be able to, instead of taking two hours to get to, an hour, over an hour to get to central London, uh, or two hours to get to Heathrow, they'll be able to get from uh, Woolwich to central London in about 15 minutes. Um, that means that the workers there can find jobs in the city um, or at Heathrow, but conversely that you can have the movement of uh, companies and industry uh, to those areas too. I mention this because um, when I went to London and talked to friends there about how they were about to open this new line, this vast line, um, and on top of the Overland, the Docklands Light Rail line, 
the Jubilee line, which uh, opened in 2000, I mean, enormous investments in these things. They were so accustomed to that that they were just complaining that it took them forever and they're not doing And I'm thinking, you know, here we are in New York City, we've like opened, what, three new subway stations, four new subway stations since 19, help me. Yeah, 60, I mean, it's just, it's well, simply Moses unbelievable. Promise for taking down the, the L and removing the streetcars was the second half of the summer. Right. But what is, exactly, but what has happened in London is that, uh, you know, you, you had a place that before these investments were made, before Canary Wharf, the world's plus and minuses, was, you know, a relatively provincial capital. And now Brexit is, the, of course, the, the question, but, you know, became the great global capital. Um, and I think this is girded without question by massive investments in, in public transit. There's an interesting twist to this now because public transit, you know, I can remember it's not that many years ago that the subway, uh, you did not see the kind of people riding the subway that you see today. It is perfectly fashionable, okay to live in a place and depend on the subway. In fact, the subway is pulling people yep. to neighborhoods that didn't have that. Does that mean in a place like London, if you bring that streetcar into those neighborhoods and you're essentially making them accessible to the people who live there, yeah. what happens? Yes, so this is of course the eternal uh, problem when you have a concentration of wealth in, in a big city like New York or, or London. It's, it's, the, uh, it's the gentrification problem. I mean, you know, it, we, we all need to remember in New York that for many, many cities, most places, the word gentrification is not a bad thing. It is a desirable thing. Um, but in a city like London, or certainly in New York, the, the, this is the, the, the dilemma that you, um, you, the more you add things like public transit, uh, green space, um, um, you know, new schools, all the things that neighborhoods need, um, then you are also um, essentially promoting gentrification because you are creating neighborhoods where people can no longer afford, middle class people can no longer afford to live uh, where they could live 20 years ago, will we'll look. And in fact, I have a young friend who was an assistant uh, to me in Berlin, who's now a lawyer, a corporate lawyer in London, who can't afford to live in central London. When I told him, the crossrail is going to connect to Woolwich, a place I can promise you nobody uh, who's a corporate lawyer in London had ever heard of uh, recent, until recent. Uh, he, he went out to look. Is that good for Woolwich or is that bad for Woolwich? I mean, you know, I, my answer to this is always um, these forces, um, we need to make these improvements. They need to be made in conjunction with protection for people who are in those neighborhoods. That, that's always the, the difficulty. Let me ask you one last question in this regard, because it's come up in about after a number of these lectures. Gentrification is on everybody's mind. The, it's the uh, extreme of gentrification, not the beginning when it's turning a neighborhood around and needs it desperately and reaches a point where it's balanced. In this city, what seemed to happen in a number of neighborhoods, all of this, was there was a massive upside of over the last count of it was over 110 neighborhoods, which immediately raised the real estate values, which immediately brought in the kind of development that overpowered some of these neighborhoods with the excuse that land costs were so high that we have to build uh, cataclysmically, as Jane would say. Cata brought in cataclysmic money, as Jane calls it. Um, is there some connection here, or am I off course? No, I mean, I think, look, I don't think she's settled this problem. I think she, she had a lot of trouble with it, and, you know, uh, I think it was at the heart of, um, I think it was, it was the central problem of her 
uh, vision of the, of the city. Um, I, I don't agree that, um, that densifying uh, neighborhoods and allowing up zoning is an inherently bad thing to do. I, I think in many cases it's an extremely good thing to do. It, again, you know, these things are it's a generalization. Gentrification in many cases is a good thing. It always depends upon protections and the circumstances in, in those areas. You know, I really don't agree with our mayor about many things, but um, the, to me, the large principle that we need more housing, uh, and the only way to, to, to get more, ha not the only way, but one way to get more housing is to build more housing is not an inherently illogical thing to say. It depends on where and, uh, and how. You know, I was looking at the East Harlem um, uh, plan uh, that the neighborhood put together. Um, they have very serious concerns and quite justified reason to fear uh, gentrification and changes in that neighborhood. Um, and so, you know, the question is what kind of protections can they build in and what can they as a neighborhood get uh, which they have wanted in return for things that they don't want which is some of the upzoning and densification. The cities are organic places which are evolving and neighborhoods evolve and um, that, you know, in many ways we don't like, but I think that the nature of there being living, changing organisms is something we fundamentally do like. Um, we can't have it both ways. We can't, you know, preserve an amber uh, neighborhoods and also want them to remain vital places. I, with the village, I can't afford to live in the village anymore. Um, it's no longer my neighborhood. I, I miss it, and uh, you know there are many things about that that I, I regret. Um, it was a mixed neighborhood. It was a middle class neighborhood in many ways. It was uh, um, it was a complex and interesting place. Now I think it's fairly monocultural. It's much more beautiful. It's much better preserved. It's. Uh, uh, you know, it's a lot cleaner, um, but I, I think a lot has been lost. So I'm perfectly aware of, as we all are, of the downsides, but I think we have to avoid this idea that the only defense uh, is, you know, is, is to resist um, growth and change. I, I don't think that's a healthy or, frankly, a very urban approach. Well, I'm going to open for questions, but make one last observation. I keep pointing out to people having served for a number of years on the Landmarks Commission, but also been a, a student of the city, that we should really look more carefully at historic districts yeah. that have absorbed some incredible new, uh, well-designed, yeah. I think even better design than some of, uh, you know, outside of historic districts. Uh, upscale, but it's, so, larger scale, yeah, yeah. Um, without destroying the basic yeah. feeling of the neighborhood. And, you know, if you mention that idea to anybody in the planning, real estate, or development industry, it's like you can't preserve everything in Aspen, but historic districts are not preserved. Yeah, look, I mean, it's also a falsehood that historic preservation does not allow for growth. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, the, the, look, eternal, especially a city like this, you have these divisions between the real estate industry and often historic preservation people. Take off. These are not mutually development and uh, preservation are not uh, mutually exclusive. Um, but they, it, that is, yeah, that's the art. And, and I mean, I'm not saying anything we don't all know. Some of us have been thinking about building on this before. I have a question about that. And it hinges on the Psychological element of the equation, the psychological element of car ownership. And, yeah. you know, it's a problem that plagues not just what I was in, but it, it plagues the very notion of public transit right here and now. And, and that is, as long as our self important business and political classes persist in being driven everywhere yeah. for reasons of status and status alone. We're not going to get anywhere with this. Um, honestly, there's a uh, idea and a notion in America that when you get in your steel, your, your yeah. steel baby, and you're 
know, and you hit the road with those four wheels. That's a, that idea is inescapably linked with the idea of freedom. Yeah. The freedom of the road. You know, it's a great, you know, the American pioneer myth. And as you mentioned, Michael, when every car is going to be a camera, you're going to get a lot of people, I think, in America who are going to resent yeah. the, the, that and who are going to want to hold on to their freedom. That it is going to be linked with their automobile. I wonder if the truth you can address that. Yeah, I mean, this, this is true. I mean, you, 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 you said several things. So the first is the people who are wealthier take cars or limousines or whatever, and they're going to continue to do that, and that doesn't matter whether they're the drivers or not. And I, I think that's fine. That's a price point that they are willing to pay, and they, that sh there should be a premium to it. That's the case. Sure. The other group you're talking about, which is the vast number of people who like to own their own car, and like driving and want that sense of independence, that's a very interesting question. And that's what's unsettled, and I think that's a one, that, that's something that's gonna take generational shifts. Um, and, you know, the, the, the arrival of the driver's car does not mean that it necessarily will eliminate, you know, the um, ability of there to be car that you drive yourself. But our um, priorities of a, as a nation have to make that a luxury and a, um, a thing that is less desirable because the common good would say that um, for safety reasons, a driverless vehicle is better. And for a lot of other reasons, even the, the functioning of all driverless and and non-driverless vehicles, we need good public transit. This, this again comes from having some larger organizing principles about pricing. Um, if you make, for instance, curbside parking as expensive as it should be, if you see that the uses of all that surface parking land can be much better put to other purposes um, and uh, to creating things that cities need, you will make it less and less appealing to own a car. It, the, the difficulties will become greater. The smoking is a small but, but uh, relevant example. You can still smoke. It's just much less pleasant and, so, and much more inconvenient. It's interesting. Um, Jane uh, once said, because <clears throat> people would accuse her of being against the car, and she said, no, I'm not against the car. I'm not against anybody who wants to uh, move around in their steel cocoon uh, and sit in traffic. What I'm against is changing the city for their convenience. And I think what you're saying is if we reverse that convenience, which we have begun to do in terms of taking back certain streets and stuff, and make it harder to drive, then the appeal of it may not be as much. Yeah. Uh, you uh, mentioned the importance of um, policy in changing, changing the way we relate to public space, and I, I mean, that's obviously very true, but I was, I was just struck by your anecdote about 80th Street, because yeah. I, found that, I just found that really incredible, because I, um, mm -hmm. I think a city where people really just don't even recognize, like, <coughs> we don't even walk as though there's a difference between the road and the sidewalk, and so, um, uh, the image of people, um, right. you know, laboring just to fit onto a sidewalk and there's empty space on the street is, is, is just so, it's so funny to me. And I was just wondering how you think that, I mean, outside of yeah. policy, how do you think that we, I mean, as a society and as a culture, can change the way we um, intimately relate to public space in such a way that if we don't feel like certain spaces are um, denied to us or we don't just right. ourselves. I mean, this, uh, look, I, I'm glad that struck you, and of course, I'm, we all know the, the kinds of places you're talking about where this notion that somehow everyone has to crowd on the sidewalk and to give way to cars is insane. But here it is so not insane that I think we don't even recognize we're doing this, that hundreds of us cram into a tiny piece of broken concrete in order to leave all this space for cars. How, how, well, who, how did we get to that point? That isn't what our streets look like. In it isn't what they need to look like. So the incremental steps we are taking 
as you were said, to, to rethink the street are great. So for instance, in San Francisco, there's something called the Parklet Program. We had a, a little pilot. You know, one of the things about this administration is it has absolutely no ability to follow through on these kinds of things. We had a Parklet plan here too, and it's just not, not pushed. We, 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 um, the, the Parklet plan, by the way, is that you can, um, I believe it's that you can essentially rent out, lease, parking spaces in front of your, probably anywhere, but in any case, businesses often do it in front of their shops. And those uh, can be converted into something as long as they're open to the public. So if you convert into a, um, a putting green uh, for people to have a free um, you know, miniature golf or um, a little area with cafe tables or something. And piece by piece, people begin to take back these areas of the city which had not been theirs. Bike lanes are doing the same thing. Um, and frankly, rapid bus lanes uh, should be doing the same thing. Um, they're still transit, but they accommodate many more people and they're much healthier for the city. This administration is having a very hard time getting this done, um, which is deeply, deeply disappointing. I don't really know why they're doing this so slowly. Um, and part of it is that every parking space is if someone's going to complain in some neighborhood. It takes leadership to change this. But it's that sort of thing. To begin to tell people this space is public and its use needs to be debated and decided for the good of the public. Um, and that's why I said this passing remark about our subsidizing curbside parking. It's an incredible, I mean, think about it. Somebody's parking in this plot of land in the middle of New York City at the convenience for their car where they can leave this. I mean, I maybe mean, the wrong cars to do this. I, my family always had a car, I never did, but I, I get it. I'm just saying that, is a, that should be a really expensive thing and not just something we take for granted. Dr. Bowie, you talked a lot of areas. First of all, I don't think that's my least favorite. Yeah. Thing. But, Given what she said, and some other people really expect to say that I'll be again. Secondly, I'll be brief because it does have to do with parking. That's okay. Uh, I'm <laughs> familiar with Donald Sheep's work on the yep. high cost of your parking. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, a lot of the things, it's very risky to make predictions, uh, particularly about the future. And we have a complex amount of predictions by the nature. <laughs> <laughs> like, but uh, one thing I think we can say pointing it out again and again is when you make something zero price, yeah. it's, you're going to get congestion, whatever it is, like if you want to line up a bakery, you need to right. it, et cetera. And so a lot of the problems that, that play um, trap today, congestion, uh, hard to find a hard place of pollution and things like that are, are due to zero price right. market. And I think, as you say, that's something that plays even with autonomous cars. Yeah, although remember that those cars do remain in constant, in principle, remain in constant motion. So you do have, um, and you know, the technology is basically here by which, um, you know, I will just walk outside and press a button on my phone and that car will be there for me, take me. And because all of these things are coordinated with each other, it knows where people are and where they're going to want to go. And I mean, it, you know, it's, the technology is way beyond me, but in, in essence, the, the weight, it's not, like, not even like Uber. Um, so the, the need for curbside parking, you, if you go to a restaurant and you take the, the driver's car, why would you park? Why would you hunt around for that, especially when it's expensive? I mean, that, that's the basic principle. Um, but you know, as I said, it, it, how long that takes and whether that can be economically worked out is. San Francisco, um, by the way, also has this um, system where, I believe, where um, you can, there's an app or something, I guess it's an app, which will tell you where there is a parking space and the, the cost of the parking spaces varies depending on the availability and basically it's congestion and pricing for parking spaces, yeah. Um, and, and it's a start. Yeah. Other than anecdotal evidence, which is, uh, which you're talking about, eight, eight, is there a systematic, has there been any been a systematic study that we are studying that if you converted this much amount of space from cars to 
public use, then what is the benefit or, or why are we giving so much space to public use and what is the cost of that? Is there a way to study it properly? Yeah. I mean, I, I think there have been various studies. I mean, that's a complicated, big and complicated question because it depends, I think, on benefit to whom and what, for what use. So certainly the argument about bike lanes was involved with this question of cost-benefit, um, but both for, in terms of uh, number of people and um, also economic benefit to the neighborhood. So one of the big arguments against instituting rapid bus lines uh, was that they would hurt uh, commerce for businesses along things like Second Avenue, and then uh, studies show that the reverse happens. That it actually, because by eliminating that curbside parking, uh, the businesses felt that there would, people wouldn't be able to park and get into their shops, and in fact, the reverse happened. So that is, I think, a very effective. I think the economic argument is always a very powerful instrument uh, for social change. Um, but you know. Uh, I, there has to be a lot more work done. Yeah. You referenced Sam Schwartz and the study about um, autonomous vehicles. Yeah. Um, and you also referenced a few minutes ago congestion pricing for parking. Would you speak to the congestion pricing proposals that have been released in the last several years, most recently um, Move New York, yeah. which is sponsored by Sam Schwartz, yeah. um, and how that potentially could impact? the availability of space for pedestrians yes. um, and contribute to all the other residual benefits that you have found earlier. Well, I would just say, I mean, yeah, look, I mean, um, Move New York is a great idea, and the failure to pass congestion pricing here is deeply, deeply unfortunate. Um, the one thing, I'll, the only thing I, I can say, I don't think anybody here knows about this would disagree, um, you know, I'm teaching this class at Columbia now on, on climate change and cities, because uh, I'm involved in writing this uh, series for the Times, and I've been doing a lot of work on climate change. And one of the reasons I mention that is because um, the, it seems to me that the, um, in order to bring about progressive uh, change, one often needs to frame arguments in ways that are not um, always directly about the issue. It does, it's not always necessary to mention that climate change is the reason one does something if there are other benefits that accrue from these changes. And I think this gets back to this question of making an economic argument for people. Um, and uh, I think one of the things about Move New York is that it's, it's reframing um, the congestion arguments so that there are benefits for those suburbanites outside New York, who saw congestion pricing only as a, um, a tariff on, on them. Um, you know, I do think we have to often think about strategies um, for uh, enacting um, change. I, for instance, the plastic bag law. Um, we, we need this, but the way it was framed was um, made it extremely vulnerable. In, in different places, those plastic bag laws have passed, and they've been framed differently to um, cater to, to, uh, to suit the different communities. In Washington, D.C., where there was a lot of concern about the pollution of the river, it was seen as a, an issue about the river. Um, you know, here it was framed in a different way and not very successfully. So it, well, congestion pricing is a no-brainer. The question is how it is framed. And then, um, yeah, and, and then, uh, you know, that's true not just for congestion pricing, but for really all of this, all these things we're talking about. I guess the question is if you were a betting man, uh, how do you think the autonomous car will be introduced? Uh, will it be introduced as a commonly, yeah. a, a utility, so to speak? Yeah. Um, and how can we ensure that that will happen? And is it possible that there might be several different regimens for autonomous vehicles in high density areas of the cities? They would be utilities, whereas further out, they would be a different iteration. Yeah, I think that's exactly correct. I mean, I think 
look, you're going to have in areas like Menlo Park or Palo Alto, they're going to exist now. And so there, there will be communities where they are already a function. I think the Columbus, Ohio example I mentioned is also interesting as a kind of new tool for a certain kind of last mile, you might say, for people in underserved areas. Um, I think they will, they will be targeted. And they, they, I think actually New York is not where they will um, uh, appear first and make the biggest impact on an urban area. Really because the changes here, it's just very complex, it's just deeply complex. It's easier to imagine in a city like Los Angeles, frankly, um, where you have just lots of service parking areas and lots of curbside parking that you could imagine uh, driver's vehicles functioning much more um, easily integrated into um, a city like that where the streets can be changed. So yeah, I think there will be pockets uh, where, where they've just become normalized. Um, but that, that doesn't um, change the fact that if we don't really begin to think about this in a holistic sense, it will get ahead of us. And look, that was Jacobs's fundamental lesson. Yeah. And we've spent the last 50 years trying to uh, cope with what already had happened. So. On that note, we couldn't be closing. Yeah. We could not be closing tonight or the whole series on a more appropriate note. Um, Jacobs warned about the future. She wrote about the present. Um, and we do have to think of what lies ahead and how we can get a hold of, get ahead of it. Um, and that's going to be the real challenge when it comes to dealing with our localities everywhere. So, Michael, this was the perfect ending. Um, thank you for a very stimulating uh, evening. And thank you all for coming. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, the centennial is over but the future holds other